Hey everybody, welcome back to Challenge Athletes Live. My name is Bob Babbitt. My next guest, seriously, one of my favorite people on the planet, Dr. Brian Solberg, who is about to run his 193rd marathon. He is a crazy man. Dr. B, how you doing? Hey, good morning, Bob. It's so great to see you. Happy day. Thanks for having us. And, and thanks for doing all these great uh, virtuals through CAF. It's been so great. It's been, speaking of virtual, you have been, you've totally gone all in on virtual running. How many marathons have you done since this whole virtual thing uh, became our new world? Yeah, well, this year I'm over to over 20. Uh, seven of them have been, have been ultras. And I tell you, it's just like, it started out, I think it's just when things tough happen. Uh, for me, it's the three, three stages in life that you seem to always cycle through and they all rhyme. So it's easy to remember. It's survive, stay alive, and thrive. And gosh, those early weeks, just sitting in my chair, looking outside in that trying to survive. Okay, how do we get food? What's a mask? What is going on? It's such a tough, and, 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 and it can be a sad time too. Wow. Um, and, and then you can kind of take a deep breath, you get used to it, and then you're in the stay alive mode. Okay, I'm kind of hanging around. Now, what do we do? And bless these race directors who are trying to keep their own businesses alive, they started putting these virtuals out. And one came out, it, it had, was a 200 mile. And I had don't had not done a 200 mile yet, only 100 and 163. And so I said, okay, let, let's give this a go. And doggone, that was just great to get you out and, and into that thrive stage where you're asking what's next. And you're excited in the morning to get up because you've got a goal to go take on. Yeah. So Dr. B, take me back. You. Growing up, football, you, you were that football, guy, right? wrestling, some farm rodeo type stuff. What the heck? Yeah. yeah. And where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up in between the Bay Area of California and, okay. summers, and, then, and summers were in North Dakota, where my, where that's the home state where all my family uh, is from and, and a lot of them still live. Yeah. So you're an anesthesiologist up in Corvallis, Oregon. Right. And in 1999, all of a sudden, you're having weakness in your hands and you're, you're, uh, you're having problems controlling just your oh, body. I'm having trouble walking. I'm falling over. I mean, an anesthesiologist lives with their hands. Um, yeah, the early diagnoses uh, weren't good. They were uh, ALS, as you know, Lou Gehrig's disease, yes. or rapid onset multiple sclerosis. And thank goodness, and there were a number of other things that had gone on. There had been a car accident where we thought I was okay, but it turned out maybe not. And some x-rays, and eventually they were able to figure out that I was missing, born, missing with a bone in my neck. I literally had a, an unstable neck all of my life. All those years of, of athletics and climbing and backpacking. And, and you know, I even won the uh, senior uh, physical education award in high school. I uh, wasn't the best athlete, but doggone, they were all nice enough to vote that for me. And all the hits, all the head and neck trauma I'd taken, it should have killed me. Most people, most kids, when they're born, they die. Or when they're two to three years old, they fall off their tricycle and they transect their spinal cord above the level of the diaphragm and literally suffocate right there on the sidewalk. Yeah. So for you, we're talking the odontoid bone that protects yeah. C1 and C2. You were born without yeah. it. And most people who have this, and it's very rare to begin with, they don't live very long. Right. right? right. You're, you're like the oldest living guy. That's no, that's no, that's yeah. yes. As far as we so, know. When this, it's not just all of a sudden physically, you can't do things. You can't work, right? You, you can't be an anesthesiologist. You can't, your chosen profession is out the window. From 1999 until you found CAF, what was your life like? There was just some, some, some sad and some dark years. Um, relearned to walk twice after both of my surgeries. Had to go back in a year to the day uh, for a second one. Uh, hands pretty, pretty, pretty much affected, uh, as well as the legs. I was trying to do some athletic events. Uh, kind of did them, didn't really enjoy them. Not much joy. And, and that's, that's an interesting thing as I look back now. And of course, that day in 2002, a friend drove me down to SDTC, a much smaller event that time. Yeah. The road wasn't even closed because he could drive me down to the, to the grass and <laughs> pick me out on the cove. And yeah. I got out, he went and parked. 
and it was later in the day, so I missed a lot of the early stuff. But once again, much smaller event, a few easy ups, uh, is what I remember. No jumbo trot those days. Yeah. Uh, met Dick and Rick Hoyt, saw people, no arms, no legs, wheelchairs, doing things. And I really said, you know, what? what's my excuse? Let's get off the couch. Let's, let's get back into life and try this. Uh, I found a laminated half marathon course sitting on the ground. Picked it up, it's good to pick up litter, but also I kept it. And the next morning I went and walked it, walked that half marathon course all the way up the big hills, out to Torrey Pines and back. Took me over eight hours with my leg braces and my double cane, uh, but I did it. And that was a, a turning yeah. point, one of the most important days in my life. And I always remind our, our staff and our volunteers, our donors that we meet people which are great SDTC, but there's many we may not meet and they could still be affecting their lives can be changed that day. I, I know mine was. What was it about that? The, obviously you're seeing people who are more challenged than you are, but at the same right. time, what was it about becoming a walker slash runner that became important to you? Just, it, it was almost starting from the inside mm -hmm. and getting that strength from the inside and being able to do these things that and I can't do everything anymore and that's okay, but just being able to get out and do things and it just made me feel so much happier and gave me so much more confidence. It got me into volunteering. Uh, my son's soccer, baseball, cross country, lacrosse teams, uh, scouts, of course, got back into that and got to the point where, yeah, I use leg braces and a cane, but big deal. I can, and I can't do everything, but that's still okay. Uh, as I told one of the one of our wonderful challenged athletes who uh, has a number of, of birth defects in her, in her legs and her, and her arms, as well as a cardiac, a heart problem. She has a big scar right here. And she's really, so, you know, doesn't feel good about that scar. And I reminded her one day that our, our braces, our scars, our canes, our prosthetics, our equipment are our badges of courage. And I said, be proud of that because you made it through that and you're still here. And as one friend told me one day, he said, you know, a lot, of pe a lot of people do the Boston Marathon every year, but not too many do it with a cane and leg braces. So there and we go. A little bit about, you've been there through, through so many different generations of racing. And mm -hmm. I mean, your equipment has changed dramatically over mm -hmm. the years in terms of how much better the bracing has become. Because what, what's your fastest marathon now? Oh, I did, I did a sub five. I went and really went to do a sub five one time. It, I pushed it, it was there on the thing. And I don't need to ever do that again, <laughs> thank goodness. I mean, I'm, I'm much faster. I could break two hours in the wheelchair, of course, <laughs> but uh, on foot, it's a, it's a sub five. And you're right, the bracing. I mean, I look at some of the archaic things, wood, um, leather, steel, rods. I mean, you talk about like Jim McLaren's leg that he ran, his marathons as Conan. The things I use are very strong tensile cloth and Velcro, titanium and plastic. And the, the blessed engineers and developers, they even uh, anatomically hinge them. So it works well, especially with my right lower leg. I remember being at Carlsbad when you ran your 100th marathon. And Thank that was really, that, by the way. Gosh, you were so great. That was really fun. It was really <laughs> fun. But that was a, a pretty cool milestone from somebody who took eight hours to walk a half marathon to be running his 100th marathon, right? On your own, not in a wheelchair with bracing, but you know, with, with your angels around you, the people oh. running with you. But Friends are the best, aren't they? They just, and the that's best. just part of our community. It's our family. Yeah. So talk a little about that, about finishing that marathon, because like you've done 93 since, 193 marathons. You're going to run New York City tomorrow, which is, which is amazing, uh, virtually. But that hundredth, that was a pretty special time. It was, it was special. It was really neat. Um, to tell you the truth, you're really, you're really worried. I was really worried. As you know me, I tend to, yes. as Coach K of Duke says, bless him. If you're nervous, it means you care. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to yeah. blow up on course. We've got a film crew out, which is part of CAF and Team yeah. Chocolate Milk. We've got my friends. And I really had to watch myself not to go too fast because I was feeling so good. But kept the pace and uh, finished well under the time limit and had a ton of fun along the way. Finishing it at the same time, it's great. But then you're almost going once again, and which is a big part of CAF for all of our athletes, is you know when you've accepted is what's next. And, oh. and that gave myself a little time, but then worked into saying, well, 
maybe I'll try some ultras. And then, and, and that's where we went into the, the 50K, the double marathons, the 100K, and then of course the 100 mile or last year. Um, I would never have been able to do that without CAF, never without it. It's, it's inspiration, it's empowering the family, the teamwork, the coaching, Bob Gailey, who's yeah. big into mind, body, and spirit and moving. And of course, Peter Harsh, who is always on me, stay light on your feet, keep those moving, moving low and quick and relax that upper body. He's always told me because I'm always dead so out of my game. Um, I, I unabashedly can say, I, I don't know if I'd be alive without CAF. And, and if I was, I'm not sure I'd want to be. And what, what a gift and that's priceless. I can never pay back CAF. And you have been a volunteer at CAF, coming to the building and doing whatever. And before that, being in, in our places that were falling apart and places. Oh, yeah, that yeah, the back porch, the calf shack, yeah. <laughs> you're back to the calf shack that was condemned. <laughs> and then you were in our office that burned down. Then, <sighs> then you've been there since the, you, you basically watched CAF grow, grow up. What, what are your thoughts in terms of the growth of CAF over the years? Oh, I, I am just so, so grateful. In fact, that's, you know, every night when I go to bed and every morning when I get up, I always try and think of at least five things. It turns usually into 10 and 20 things that I'm grateful for. You know, what's the best attitude? Gratitude. <laughs> um, and to have, because when I first started, um, I would do occasional volunteers. And once I, when I became weekly or more often, I think we only had six and a half staffers at the time. Yeah. And to see the staff that has come in and who just, just they, they live with their heart. They have such a joy in seeing others succeed. And each of them has their amazing skills that they do, finance, development, uh, media. Uh, it's it just, and to see the group that comes through and how much they care for the athletes and how much they care. And once again, have, get joy in seeing other people succeed in life. Uh, it's grown so much and it's a place, I mean, we moved in the new building, all the desks, there weren't even half the desks and they were all open. And now I have to bring a card table sometimes to have enough room, which is so wonderful. It's doing so well. And I'm so thankful that the, the board had the forethought to, to financially keep CAF in such a great place. I know these are hard times for nonprofits. And I know Mr. Jeffrey Essekow has talked about how some nonprofits will come in, do some good things, for some reason hit a tough spot and then be gone. And to know that CF can be there throughout the world for generations to come just, just makes me feel really good. What's your favorite CAF moment? You know, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Every year, it's always the kids run. And I always look forward to it because I know next year's every every year the next year will be the best. The kids run and wheel. I should, I gotta get, gotta give them both props. And then of course the run and wheel together when you have kids with prosthetics pushing kids in wheelchairs. <laughs> I mean, how great is that? And I know that in 2007 we had the double fire, the fire at the coaster station building, and then of course which they still were going to make it through. And then of course then it was the fire and the air quality in San Diego County, and we came back after 07 and 08 was just fabulous. And I know that. Uh, at our new location, I believe it's still down Mission Bay, if that still is going to happen, wherever it is, it's going to be even better uh, than it's ever been before. And so that's going to be my favorite CF mode because I, you're always supposed to start the run at nine. And I sort of do, but I only peel off after 100 yards and I turn around, go get some more snacks because I'm waiting till 10 o'clock to watch the kids run and wheel. And then I take off for real, even though my time started at nine. So yeah, that's been my been my way of doing it. Me, hopefully you're you're 20, I guess, next year for me doing it. Because this year, you know, seven we I did it, did it by myself, learned from that. This year did not do it by myself. Had about a dozen friends, and we all started at we met at uh, 615 down at La Jolla Cove on SDTC day, October 18th, and we did the classic half marathon course all the way up into Torrey Pines and back. And one of the great things was that one of my guides, she's a great runner, um, broke, broke her leg. She's actually been my guide and she had a broken leg. So I got her my, my hand cycle 
and she trained in the hand cycle for the four weeks before this. And we had two of our friends and then myself, we, we, all, we all had canes because some of those big hills are really right. tough. And so we put the cane in the back of the seat and actually pushed her up some of the big hills. So, and that was, even with all the shenanigans and goofing around that half marathon still was like a 315. Uh, so a long way down hour one back in 02, yeah. So for you, you just did something that is pretty unbelievable. Talk about the run across Tennessee that virtually oh. that you did. Oh my God, great, how many miles great. is that? Oh, it's 635. Yeah. Great virtual race across Tennessee. It's put on by Lazarus Lake. And for our viewers, if you've never heard of the Barkley Marathon, find yeah. it on Netflix. It's where and they Great literally film. title it, Where Dreams Go to Die. Uh, you know, the Ironman, Ironman Kona. Great event. But what, maybe 2,000 finish it every year about, pretty much? Well, the, the Barkley said about five total. Yeah. The Barkley has no more than one winner each year and many years has none. That tells you how tough it is. It's based in the yeah. mountains of Tennessee on a jailbreak. Anyway, so Lazarus Lake, he couldn't do his event. So he puts it out there and he thinks maybe he'll get 100, 200 people. He got over 19,000 people, totally outstripped where he was going. He, he, bless him, he found people to do the tech, to put maps together, virtuals for us, a great community Facebook page. Um, and that was a lot. That was, I, I averaged a little over uh, 10 miles a day for almost two months to finish that because uh, you had four months to do it. I gave myself a goal of trying to finish under two months, which I did. Um, and once again, that have that dream in the morning, be looking out there through the tunnel, find the light, who knows when it's gonna come. We know it's there, but on that way, find something every morning that you're excited about getting up and doing. And you know, the other neat thing about doing these miles is you can eat whatever the heck you want. You become I, a furnace, you burn it all. I, I'm having pizza. Uh, I got a new one coming up, which is the seven seven marathons and seven continents. If things go well, I'm going to try and win it. I won a hundred mile virtual earlier, just getting it done. There were no big ultra runners in there. I'm going to try and do seven marathons, seven days. I'm stocking up on mashed potatoes and rice, and and pot pies and pizzas and uh, Gatorades in the garage. Because I won't have time to go to the store. I'm going to try and do seven marathons in seven days. If I don't, that's okay. I've got three and a half months to do it. But that's what's next. Yeah. Big B, thank you so much for taking time, Dr. B. You're always so much fun to chat with and, and such a huge, huge part of what makes CAF great. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Bob, for CAF. Thanks to all my running. Oh, wait a second. I got my. This is, oh, this is there it is. Right? Now, why? why? Where did this come from? That came from one of my first marathons on foot um, when I was by myself. I think it was a rock and roll, probably rock and roll 02. Yeah. And I was, there's not really the good tracking that we have now. I was way ahead of schedule and my family couldn't find me and they were afraid I was dead somewhere. <laughs> and so my kids who were like in second and fourth grade at the time said, dad, if you wear one of your funny hats that you wear when you volunteer to do the school traffic, we'll be able to find you. So that's the one that doesn't bother me much. And, you know, I, I wear it for most events. And when I don't wear it, people give me a bad time. <laughs> so, yeah. I love it. Dr. B, thanks so much for taking time. This has been Challenged Athletes Live. Dr. Brian Solberg has been our guest. Thank you for everything you do for CAF, Brian. You're the best. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.